Hello, and welcome to the Plastech Academy. I'm Dennis Preshak, President and CEO of the Plastech Group. Thank you for joining us here today to kick off our monthly webinar series. When our customers work with Plastech, they don't just get a molder that molds parts. They get a high quality partner in their complete package design process that includes industrial design, product design, mold design and building, molding, value added assembly and where desired decorating. We value our business relationship and do all we can to meet your needs. Today we'll present Plastech's product development and tool building segment and with that I'd like to introduce you to Tim Zurich, package development engineer, Ken Watkins, design engineering manager, and Bob Preshak, general manager of Triangle Tool Company, one of Plastech's three complete mold building shops. To everyone watching, good luck and happy learning. Good morning, I'm Tim Zurt, and I'll be taking you through the package development process. So in the initial phases, we get industrial design and we can receive this multiple ways. We can either get it from the customer, your internal group, or the, the design firm that you're working with, or we develop it internally here at Plastech. Uh, we use this industrial design as our framework for all package development. On the left, you can see an image of a hand sketch that was done by our internal group. It's of a candy dispenser or a mint dispenser. Um, and we would use this as the first step in creating this package. Once we receive the industrial design, package development reviews this for manufacturability and cost effective. Using CAD, we review the form, fit, and function of the components, and we establish seals, snap features, living hinges, et cetera. We then take that form, fit, and function that we've developed, and we, take, we create a tolerance stack up based on those nominal dimensions. Uh, sustainability has become increasingly important over the years. Um, so we're looking at how can we lightweight packages as much as possible? Can we reduce the number of components in each, com in each package? things along those lines. Um, and material selection goes hand in hand with sustainability. So we're looking at, can we make the package a mono material or can we make the package separable uh, so that you can put the different materials into different recycling streams. PTC Creo 5.0 is the CAD system that we use here at Plastech. Uh, we have connectivity from industrial design all the way to manufacturing. So this allows us to have easy transference between our industrial designers, package development, mold design, and manufacturing. Um, in all of our multi-component assemblies, uh, we create assemblies inside of Pro-E, and we can review the form, fit, and function there. So seals, snaps, things along those lines, uh, we, can, we can assemble those all together and ensure that they work well together. Uh, we use PDM link internally. Uh, so we store all of our data. We have all the old iterations of it, so it's easy to retrieve that. Uh, this keeps the whole system organized, um, so easy transference from one group to the other. Keyshot 8.0. On the left is an animation showing the use of a package. Uh, we, we do this to, to give a good representation of how a package is going to work. We also do animations of how packages are assembled. Um, on the right is just an image taken from screen, uh, screenshot of Keyshot. So we're looking, we can create photorealistic images for you to take to your marketing group or to your customers uh, and show what your package would look like with your labels, your colors, anything that is required, we can put that on there. Uh, we can get a pretty quick turnaround on that. Adobe Creative Cloud. Uh, we generally use two programs in this system. Uh, we use Photoshop and Illustrator. Photoshop, we use this to, to manipulate the, the labels that we've been supplied um, or retrieve those labels from, from online uh, to put on packages for presentations for you. Uh, we can also, if you give us the label that you want, we can take an STL file out of our Creo system, bring it into Photoshop, and we can apply that label directly onto the 3D part, and then we can print that part with your label directly on it. Uh, so this kind of eliminates the need for one-up labels. In Illustrator, we can take a PDF um, drawing that is supplied to us. Uh, usually we get QC drawings or, or drawings with limited information. Uh, we can turn those into DWGs or DXFs 
And this allows us to get more dimensions and get more information so that we can reverse engineer something more close to what was originally there. Our Stratus Connex 260 machine, um, on the right, the image shows all the different, we have uh, three bay material, we have three bays for materials. So we can print multiple colors, um, a wider range. On the left, you can see an image of about 24 deodorant barrels. So we do have a pretty big build plate, so we can build things pretty quickly. Um, we have an internal, we have a Plastec owned uh, rapid prototype mold that we can print digital ABS cavities and cores and put those in there and run them um, and get real plastic samples to you. Uh, this process takes a little bit less than 10 days and it's good for limited sample runs. Um, a lot of times we can use this for living inch parts. So you can get SLS or you can get SLA models printed with your hinge, but it doesn't always react the same way. Uh, we also, as I said, we can print labels directly on the part. We only have a three bay system, but we do have connections to six bay systems, so we can get the colors pretty much spot on. Uh, we also do over molding. Um, so if you're doing a soft touch on your package, we can print a TPE like material and give you two different materials on one part. Mold flow fusion and abacus are FEA softwares that we use internally. Um, so during the initial phase during package development, I'm going to look at how many gates does it need, gate locations for optimal filling. Um, this is mostly done for living hinge parts. Um, we are always concerned about gate locations, but number of gates is usually for living hinged. Uh, during this initial phase, we also do a molding window and we do a fill and pack to verify the design. Uh, Fusion and Abacus, these are our stress analysis softwares. So we'll, we're using this to review things along the lines of top load, retention force, rotational force. In that initial mold flow, we're not, we're not looking at the cooling whatsoever. Um, that's done during the pilot tool phase. This phase is just looking at how is the part filling? Did we thin wall it too much? Do we see any serious hesitations? Do we see thick areas that we can reduce? Um, and things along those lines. The, the animation on the right was showing filling through a hinge. Um, so we do see some, some hesitation there, but we do see that it does fill. Um, so we're not concerned about that moving forward. Fusion 360, um, this is the simpler version of stress analysis. So it's, it's used when we have a, a wide selection of concepts that we need to kind of trim down before we move into Abacus. Um, so this one has a much faster turnaround. Um, the results are accurate, but to get the final results, we do move into Abacus. Uh, FEM cooling for mold flow, we use this as a transference tool. Um, so a lot of our cooling lines anymore are conform conformal or they are complicated. Um, so we are looking at a lot of surfacing being done. So Fusion helps us transfer that more accurately and more quickly. Uh, generative design, this is mostly done in steel right now. Um, so we're looking at, they're looking at lightweighting steel components. Um, they are looking to bring this into plastics as well. So what we would end up doing is putting loads and forces on the parts and seeing where we could take plastic out. Abacus, a lot of times we're looking at, can we, can we reduce the weight in a component? Um, how can we lightweight something? So this, this is an example of our stock barrel. We currently are running a thick walled barrel um, on, the, on the right. And then on the left, we're looking at, can we thin wall it? And how far can we go in thin walling it? Um, so these, these are just stress plots showing a top load applied to it. Um, and this would be a good candidate based on the stress. Um, we don't see significant increases and we don't see significant increases in deformation. Once all that is completed, we move to the part design review. Uh, so we sit down with our project managers, mold design, tooling, processing, assembly, and quality control. And we review all of the details of the parts with them. Uh, we, we lay out what the critical areas are and any customer driven design elements that are required. Uh, we go through all of that for manufacturability. Um, tooling will then come back with any suggestions that we could tweak the part to make it, to make the tool less complex or to improve the longevity of the tool. 
Um, any of those changes then will be brought back to you, the customer, and we'll review those with you. Um, if you sign off on them, we will implement them in the final design, and that's when we'll hand it back to Mold Design and they'll begin their process. At this time, we'll put a quick poll up, and then Ken Watkins will join us for Mold Design. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I'm Ken Watkins, Engineering Manager here at Plastech. I'm going to review our mold design process. Here at Plastech, we use a team approach during the design process. Early in the design planning phase, we bring in our tool shop personnel, our process engineers, and our molders during the early reviews, product design, and the mold design planning. We believe by having all of our organization's expertise concentrated during this phase of the project, it allows us to design and build superior molds that will perform extremely well during their lifetime. One of the main benefits of having everyone involved early is it allows us to dramatically reduce our mold design and build lead time, allowing our customers to have a quicker time to market. The reason for this is by having everyone involved very early, we're able to capture any inputs, recommenda recommendations or requirements. We can have them integrated into mold design early as opposed to having them vetted out at a later time, possibly during a project milestone review, which would cause for an unnecessary rework cycle back through design and into the tool shop, causing unnecessary delays to the project. So during the mold planning and design phase, we want to ensure that we are fully interfaced with our product design team and understand the design criteria and the customer requirements for the mold. We want to ensure that we understand uh, the cavitation, uh, we properly size the mold, we have a desired press to run it in, um, and review how the how the mold is going to function mechanically and also any impress maintenance or change out requirements so the first thing we do is we take a look at the part the design and we determine if we've we've molded the same part for the customer in a previous mold and we're increasing a cavitation or a similar part we ensure that we leverage those designs and determine any best practices and any possible improvements that we may have and can implement in the new mold design we also need to fully understand any other customer requirements, possibly for interchangeability, as customers uh, sometimes require cavities and cores, hot runner systems, mold bases to be used interchangeably with other molds that are owned by that customer. We also need to understand if there's any change out kits, uh, if, the, if the mold needs to run multiple variations of the part, and we need to change out components in the press, we want to make sure that we, we have all those captured and we understand them. And also, if there's any requirements uh, for lifting fixtures or any other safety devices that need to be designed. By having the product design team and our molders involved in this process early, we can also understand any uh, secondary operations in those requirements, such as assembly, decorating, how the part's going to be packaged. Um, so the engineering team is fully aware of those requirements. So after we get through that phase, uh, we, we want to make sure that you know, even though that we can design and build the mold, we want to ensure that we can optimize the process and efficiently mold the part. So this is where it's very critical for us to have our process engineers involved so we can leverage their expertise uh, in this stage. So we do formal reviews to ensure that uh, the parts reviewed, uh, wall thicknesses, uh, draft angles, any surface finish requirements, 
uh, how the mold's going to be cooled, where we're going to place the, the cooling channels, and how we're going to size them. But most importantly, that we must do a part fill uh, analysis and review with our process engineers to help deter determine the optimum gate location and size and the gate type. So the next step is we want to ensure that we have the proper mold type selected for this part. If we can achieve the cavitation levels that are required by the customers in a single base mold, we'll go that route, whether it's a two plate mold or, or a three plate mold. But very often we have uh, high cavitation level requirements where we don't require to go to a larger press for, stunning, for, for tonnage. So we'll design and build a stack mold. Plastec has a tremendous amount of experience uh, building and, and, and running stack molds, as well as uh, two shop molds, multi-shop molds. So once we determine that and we're, we're, we have uh, our gate uh, type uh, determined, whether it's a hot tip, a valve gate, and sometimes uh, it's a hot edge gate, which we, we need to know uh, very early on uh, what type of gate we're going to have. Once we have a preliminary design layout uh, and the mold sized, we want to ensure that the, the, the press that we plan to run it in, that the mold will, will be able to run and function properly. So the first thing we have to do is we have to confirm that we have uh, the injection capacity for the part weight cavitation and also the required amount of tonnage and clamping force in the press. We have to determine that physically that the mold will be able to be easily uh, installed into the press, clamped properly, and that it doesn't exceed any minimum or maximum daylight specifications of the press. Also, probably most importantly, is that we have to ensure that the, the press can safely carry the weight, uh, the projected weight of the mold. We have to understand if we have to add any additional support structure and integrate it into the design for the press, particularly to carry the, the moving half of the mold. So once we've determined that, we want to ensure that we have uh, a proper design for impress maintenance. We want to make sure we can do preventative maintenance, also periodic clean. We want to be able to periodically clean parting lines, vents. We want to be able to safely move stripper plates, cavity plates in the mold to, to clean the strippers, to clean uh, tips, nozzles. We want to ensure that we have the ability to do that. We also want to ensure that we have the ability to change out any molding components, cavities, cores due to wear or damage in the press, and also any required change out kits to eliminate the need to pull the mold from the press and uh, cause uh, excessive downtimes. We also determine whether or not we need to develop, during the development cycle, uh, design and build a prototype or a pilot mold. And when we do that, we ensure that that design, we matched 100% with what we plan to do for the production mold so that anything that we learn from the pilot tool can be carried directly into the production mold and we have a production ready mold once it's built. So after the design is complete as a final sanity check, uh, we, we want to go back and make sure that we do uh, fill, fill and cooling analysis on the mold. And once that's complete, we, we perform our final mold design reviews. So we, we, we conduct internal reviews with the product design team, the tool, the, the tool shop, and our molders again to ensure that we have uh, captured all the customer requirements and any internal requirements that were needed for the mold build and being able to run the mold. So once that's complete, we conduct a final mold design review with our customers to again to make sure that we've met all the requirements and then we release the design to our tool shop for build. So now we've completed two of our four segments today for the presentation. And we want to thank everyone again for joining and hopefully you can stay tuned for the second half. We're going to put up another poll question while we welcome Mr. Bob Prishat, our general manager of our tool shop, to come up and discuss the tool build process. Thank you.
Good morning, I'm Bob Frischak, General Manager of Triangle Tool. We're now going to discuss the construction and qualification of an injection mold. The following slide shows the basic processes in a tool shop. Each process serves as a unique purpose and basically is a linear flow process. We will now go through those processes. The first process is prints are released and steel is ordered. Detailed drawings and models are released from engineering. Steel and required purchase items are ordered by the tool shops. The detailed drawings are then distributed to each department based on machining requirements. Soft machining, milling, rough, ma rough machining of mold components leaves stock on them prior to being heat treated. Mold based plates are rough machined, ground for parallelism, and then finished machining. Turning, we have a two and a seven axis operation. Once again, components are rough machined with stock left on them prior to heat treat. Gun drilling is another aspect of soft machining. All mold based plate water lines are gun drilled, and any details with large, small holes are also gun drilled. These components are then sent to heat treat. The purpose of heat treating is to increase the hardness of the component for added longevity. When parts are heat treated, their stress is induced into them. Parts are then stress relieved through heat or vibration. After heat treat, parts are then given to be placed in the final machining process. Hard milling, two and a half axis, three axis, and five axis operation is one. Hard turning, two and seven axis operation is another. Grinding for slots and, and long plates is another operation in final machine. EDM or electric discharge machining, either via sinker or wire EDM also takes place. After the components are finished machined, they are, are then determined if they need polish. This is usually dictated to us by our customer. The picture on the right is a picture of a diamond polished component. The picture on the left is etched. We also do draw polishing of components for mold release. Plating of components. Any non-stainless components need to be plated for corrosion resistance. Common plating for that would be chrome or nickel. Some parts with limited draft need to have a, um, plating done for release. A common release plating we would use would be nickel boron. Any sliding or mating components are plated for wear resistance. Some common plating for that would be tin, balanite, and on board. After the parts are all completed, they are then sent to component inspection. Documentation of a critical steel dimension based on FAI requirements is on all prints. Some of the instruments used for measuring the steel and recording it is a CMM dial indicator and tool microscope. Mold assembly. Any components that need assembled within another component are assembled on a bench. Bushings, pins, interlocks, and other components on the frame are then placed into that frame. The manifold is then placed on, is then placed on the cavity plate that is heated up and checked for the proper growth. After that is done, the mold is completely assembled, ready to be sent to the molding floor. Mold qualification to identify critical and quality characteristics, of which consist of critical dimensions, first article dimensions, and functional characteristics. Scientific molding is performed on all molds, which includes dry cycle, balance of fill, gate freeze, and mold viscosity. The initial sampling, which we call T1, is for a limited amount of time. A DOE is performed on during that sample. Those parts are then measured, and thus we come up with what we would call a center line process. After we have a center line process, we go to a T2 sample. This is usually four hours or more. This, the purpose of this is to get the critical dimensions to prove out that they have a 1.33 CPK. After they are measured for this limited run, we then go to an MQR, a mold qualification. We then run at the minimum of eight hours where we have acceptance criteria and we record any historical revisions made to dimensions of the part. First article inspection, a complete, independent, and documented physical and functional inspection of the process. 
The purpose of the first article is to make sure that we produce an acceptable part as specified by design documents such as engineering drawings, planning, purchase orders, and engineering specifications. Some of the equipment used by our first article are division system, CMM, toolmaker scope, various hand gauges and force gauges. And finally, acceptance criteria. Critical dimensions are usually developed after the T2 sampling and adhere to a CPK of 1.33 or greater. First article dimensions are usually developed after the T1 sampling and, and require a CPK of 1.0 or greater. Functional tests, which include torque tests, cap removals, insertion force, are not required to pass a CPK. Visual defects, either supplied by the customer or plastic adheres to industry standards. Wrapping up this tool segment, Bill, we'll throw up our last poll question, and Tim will be back to review a case study to support today's information we provided for you. Thank you. So going through the case study, uh, we did we looked at a 33 millimeter stock flip top lid. Project summary. So we did this design for Brazil. Um, so working in conjunction with that group down in in our our global department. Uh, the project goal was to redesign an existing package that had a silicone valve in it um, for a more cost-effective package. Uh, the new cap had to function the same without the silicone valve, so no leaking, no dripping. Um, we also needed the hinge to function as well too. The provided information, uh, we were given samples of the existing Valved, valved cap and bottles from Brazil. Uh, we were supplied with the neck finish and we went to the market and found similar uh, pack, similar caps without silicone valves in them to use as a baseline study. Uh, using all of this information, uh, we developed an in-molded basket to help with the, drip in the dripping and the leaking. So we're looking at the form, fit, and function in this stage. So we, we developed the original design. Um, we came up with, with a hinge for this that should function as well. Um, and the design was sent to the customer for their approval. Upon customer approval, we did a molding window. So on the, the top image shows uh, one of the results from a molding window. So you can see the large green section. Uh, we do have a large processing window. So this is a good, we, we don't, we aren't limiting our, our processing team. The bottom animation is showing the part filling. Um, so we, again, this is the, the same cap from before. Um, we do have one gate on it. We do see hesitation through the hinge area, but we do see that it does pack out well. Um, it does fill well. Um, so there's no real concerns there. Once that's done, we've released it to Mold Design. Um, mold Design proceeded to create a four cavity pilot tool. Um, and we, we went through and we reviewed everything with them. And we made any adjustments that were necessary for, for tooling. Um, once that pilot tool was done, we did an FEM mold flow on it. So we took the water lines and reviewed the warp analysis and the, the temperature in the mold. Um, the water lines show that we don't see significant increases in the temperature across the water line. So we are getting good flow throughout. Um, we don't see any real hot spots in this tool. Um, so those were good as well. Um, any 
major warpage would be due to uh, the differential shrinkage of the material because it is different wall thicknesses throughout. We ran the first sample and we found that the hinge did not function as well as we had, we had anticipated. Um, so we, during that, that T1 phase, we brought it back, um, we redeveloped the hinge and resampled it. Once we did that, the hinge worked fine. Uh, it met all the criteria. The form, fit, and function were good, and all of the other critical dimensions met expectations. So once we did that, we went through T1, T2, MQR here in, in Erie um, with the pilot tool, and then mold design went back. They they developed the the process the uh, production tool, and we released that down to Brazil, and the production tool was built in Brazil. Hi, my name is Nicole, moderator with the Plastec Academy, joining you today for our Q&A session. We have just heard from package development, mold design, and tool build. Thank you to our presenters today. They sure did share a great deal of information with you. Before we conclude today, we would like to open this webinar up to you. If you have not already, Please take a moment now to submit your questions using the chat feature or the questions button, which I believe is on the right hand side of your screen today. We will answer a few now with the time that we have left. While you're writing in, I also want to remind you we have provided some handouts you can download for your reference later. Be sure to check them out and open them before you leave here today. Okay, just another couple seconds while I get the guys back on the line and we'll start with the Q&A. All right, welcome back guys. Okay. So let me see here, looking through the list. I see one here from Anthony. This looks like a good one for tooling. Bob, the first question is, does Plastec have a warranty policy on tooling? Anthony, we have a three year or three million cycle warranty. However, if the mold is run at a plastic facility, maintenance is covered for the entire lifetime of the mold. Thank you, Bob, that's great to hear. All right, I see some more coming in. Thank you for your participation and your questions. All right, I was scrolling through, checking out what else has come in. All right, here we go. I think this one, uh, Tim can answer for us. Tim, the next question I see is from Darcy. She writes, in terms of cost, what does plastic charge for a customer for industrial package development services? Um, so usually depending on the scope of the project uh, and, the, and the time needed, um, typically plastic does not charge for industrial design. Awesome, Tim. It's such a great opportunity for someone looking to evaluate a new design idea. All right, as I look through here, everyone, I just wanna say great questions and info going back and forth here today. We have time for one more Q&A. Let me take another look and see if I can find one for Ken. Here we go. I see. Jack wrote in to ask, Ken, how does mold design departments benefit from being integrated with tool shops? Well, uh, the greatest benefit I see with, with our team being fully aligned with our product design team and our, and our tool shops is our ability to implement any customer change to the product design to the tool shops very quickly, uh, usually the same day. All right, thank you, Ken. Darcy, I hope that um, 
Jack, I hope that answered your question. Okay, um, so all right, everyone, that's a wrap. Please note that if we are unable to get to your questions today during the webinar, our Plastic Academy team will review them and either get back to you individually or answer them in our wrap-up webinar event at the end of our monthly series schedule. From all of us here today and everyone at the Plastic Group, we again thank you for attending and actively participating in our process flow, product development, and tool build webinar today. As you exit the webinar, you will see a brief survey. We appreciate your time, feedback, and look forward to bringing you more great topics in our Plastic Academy. See what the next series topic is at plasticgroup.com. And until next time, have a great day, everyone.